I want to look in two passages of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 5 and then Hebrews 12. But in, in chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, In fact, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. The purpose of being Christ followers is to be able to communicate to others the truth that you know about Jesus. We're not just perpetual students. The, the purpose of learning is so that others can know. You'll never learn something better than when you're preparing to give it away to somebody else. If you could explain it, you understand it. If you can't explain it, you don't really know what you're talking about. Verse 13, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, isn't acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That last phrase is really the one I want to call, call your attention to. Who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, at first glance, you think, well, it's not hard to distinguish good from evil. But, but I would disagree with you. I think increasingly we're doing everything we can to, to blur the lines between good and evil. You know, baseball season's just started. If you watch the hitters, a lot of times when they step into the batter's box, you know, they'll start moving the dirt around. And those lines that so clearly identify that box at the beginning of the game, by the time you get the fourth or the fifth inning, you can't tell where the batter's box is. They're looking for latitude. A little grace. And I would submit to you, we're living in a season when there's a lot of effort being made to blur the lines. And, and the author of Hebrews here, he's writing to a group of believers, to Jewish believers specifically. And he says, by constant use, you can train yourselves to distinguish good from evil. I suspect we still know that murder is wrong and adultery is wrong and stealing is wrong. Those big Ten Commandment ideas. But in truth, we've taken those off the walls. We don't want them posted on public property anymore. We were somehow, we felt infringed upon just by a statement of those 10 moral boundaries. We didn't want to see those in the public. Story. That seems like a pretty blatant attempt to me to blur the lines, doesn't it? In fact, what the Bible said is happening in our generation. They're calling evil good and good evil. It's okay in the public square these days to mock Christianity. Comedians do it. Late night talk show hosts do it. So it's a part of the, the course of debate when, when they said one of our, our leaders of our nation was insane because of his faith on a national TV program. And there wasn't an outcry of deafening outcry. The person that said that still got their job. Imagine making that statement about some a subset of our culture. The cry of indignation, bullying, intolerance would reverberate. So the lines are being blurred, and the only way for you and I to maintain our perspective and know what a Christ follower is, is through constant use, the dexterity of handling the truth so that it stays close to us. Because sadly, the churches aren't even helping us a great deal. Far too often, we want to be accepted more than we want to hold up the truth. Let's stay in Hebrews, look in chapter 12. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Amen. You know, anybody here look forward to being disciplined? Words carry more than one meaning, and that's true with discipline. One way of understanding discipline is something external that is directed towards you. We're, children are disciplined by their parents. Uh, we are disciplined on the highways by those with authority. And very seldom does that discipline feel pleasant. Agreed? It's necessary. In fact, that's the way the word is used in the larger context of Hebrews 12. It says God disciplines his children. If he doesn't discipline you, he doesn't love you. You're an illegitimate child. So God brings his authority to bear in your life. That means his will is asserted against your will. And a part of being a Christ follower was learning to yield your will to God's will, submitting to his discipline. And at the point where those two challenge one another, it is seldom pleasant. But this verse says to us that it produces a harvest if we've been trained by it. You know, it's possible to be disciplined, but not be trained by it. You ever gotten more than one speeding ticket? Don't raise your hand. Because I don't want to raise mine. <laughs> We weren't disciplined by it, were we? We just said, well, I got caught once. Maybe I'll be more fortunate the next time. Boom. 
We have to choose. You can be disciplined and still stand in rebellion and be completely unchanged by it. Now, there's another definition of discipline that's equally helpful, and that's internal. We choose to discipline ourselves. We submit ourselves to discipline. We call it self-discipline. But you need both sides of that definition to get the full meaning of that word discipline. We will yield to the authorities beyond us, and then we will make the choices ourselves to discipline ourselves, to say no. We have to say no to ourselves. Happiness does not come from greater license. The truth is, when we submit to God's discipline and we become disciplined individuals, our joy and fulfillment and contentment in life goes up. It's not pleasant in the moment, but the outcomes are amazing. So we began our year with these 10 ideas, these 10 statements of intent. And they had to do with orienting our lives towards the Lord in a season. It was a season of training. We said, we'll submit to this discipline for a season so that we'll be prepared 100 days from now to cooperate with the Lord, to receive from the Lord, to recognize the Lord in ways that we couldn't 100 days ago, no matter how sincerely we tried. Now, the intent is important because if you don't hold the intent, it's highly improbable you'll have the outcome. I love this time of year because I love summer vegetables in Tennessee. I love those fresh summer tomatoes and the green beans and the new potatoes and the squash and the corn. I'm getting hungry. All right. But you know, those things don't happen automatically. They don't come from Kroger, not originally or Publix. If you want those in your backyard, you actually have to turn the soil and plant the seeds and hoe the weeds and water the plants. And you have to have the intent. You can't sit in the house and say, I'm a godly man. I got a garden. No, you'll be a hungry, godly man. <laughs> and, and so many of the best things of God require an intent on your part or mine to have the outcome. And that's what these 10 statements are about. I want to walk back through them with you really quickly. I suspect they're familiar to many of you. Many of you have been living with them. The first one says, I intend to read through my Bible this year. I'm going to read my Bible every day. 10, 15 minutes a day, we'll be through the whole book this year. We started in January with the New Testament, and we finished the book of Revelation before Easter. We blew through the whole New Testament in under 100 days. How many of you read the New Testament with us? Awesome. That is amazing. Thank you for that. What were the rest of you doing? Reading online news reports, no wonder you're depressed. (laughs) 15 minutes a day, you can read through the whole Bible. Now, here's the challenge we face. You finish the New Testament. That means next is the Old Testament. (laughs) And you've read the important part, right? I mean, you read the Jesus story. You got him out of the grave. I'm kind of, you know, I don't know if I want to do that or not. It's summertime. Folks, the New Testament makes no sense without the Old Testament. I promise you the value, the significance, the weight of what you just read will will multiply exponentially as you read through the Hebrew Bible. So don't lose your courage. Come on, go with us. We're going to work on that a little bit before we go. We're going to read through our Bible this year. Number two is we're going to pray every day. Every day we're going to say a prayer. We're going to become a people who pray. Never again will we say, well, you know, I don't pray much, Pastor. I'm not a prayer. We're done with that. That is not an excuse we use anymore. We pray every day. Every cotton-picking day, we offer a prayer to the Lord. If your head hits the pillow at night and you haven't prayed, get up. None of those lazy, horizontal, one-eyed prayers. (laughs) Now I lay me down to... (sighs) If you hit the pillow at night and you haven't prayed, hop up. Stand there beside the bed, raise your hands. God, thank you for this day. You gave me the strength to get through another one. Help me to sleep well. I want to serve you tomorrow. Good night. Boom. Every day you say a prayer. Every day. Then the third one, we said, I intend to honor God in my home. I am going to honor God in my home. I'm not just going to church and sit there and sing along and stand up and nod at the appropriate points in the sermon. I am going to end my home. The hardest mission field in the world is your home. I get on a plane and go to Africa and I am Billy Bad for Jesus. Because all they know me is in a very limited context, standing behind a podium, got my Bible open. You know, they think I act like that all the time. The people that live with me, we're going to honor God in our homes. 
Let's stop complaining because they can't honor God in the schools. Let's let God be so honored in our homes that even our kids won't understand why we can't do it at school. Number four, I intend to work with integrity. Now we're moving outside our homes. This is just about who I am at home. This is about who I am in the marketplace. I work with integrity. I intend to be the best employee here, not because of just my production, but my character. When it snows in Kentucky, I'll go to work anyway. I'm going to be different. I'll be on time. I will go with a sense of serving, not with a sense of entitlement. My faith will be a part of who I am in the marketplace. Well, they don't like that. I didn't say be belligerent or obnoxious. Don't stand on the table in the break room and preach. I will work with integrity. What's number five? I intend to teach children to respect God and his people. If you have little people in your house, that's a very primary responsibility. If you don't, you still have that responsibility. There are people younger than you under your sphere of influence. You know, I have, I've come to understand that the definition of children changes. If you're a young parent, children is defined by people who don't yet go to school or can't yet feed themselves. That's children. But as you turn the calendar pages, I have people look at me and go, oh, child. And I'm thinking, talk on. <laughs> That's my kind of like young man. I'm like, I'm liking you. <laughs> We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people engaging worship and transformational encounters and exploring the Word of God together. There is something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 4 and 6 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m., Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. I intend to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's a lifelong learning. We took 100 days to focus on that intentionally and purposefully, and we've talked about it a little bit. We're going to talk about it some more. I'm not talking about experiences. Well, I, I've made a profession of faith. I've been born again. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm happy for you on both counts. But cooperating with the Holy Spirit is more than checking a box on experiences. Jesus said to his closest friends, it's better for you if I leave, because if I leave, I will send you a comforter to help you. Now, if Jesus thought his absence was going to improve the quality of their spiritual journey, just perchance you and I should pay attention. And start to say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in my life. I, I find that because of a whole lot of reasons, we tend to talk about the Holy Spirit with limiting terms. Well, I'm willing to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, but I'm not going to whatever. I got news for you. He won't bother you. He only comes where he's welcome. And we haven't been the most welcoming people. Imagine you go for a job interview. You want the job. You really want it. And you go in for the interview and say, listen, I'd love to work here, but I want to take you to the front. I'm not going to. Whatever comes out after that is putting that job and you further and further apart. Agreed? And yet we treat the, the spirit of the living God like that. I want to make a suggestion. Just begin to say to the Holy Spirit, I want to cooperate with you. Help me to recognize your voice. I will give up my dignity to cooperate with you. I didn't say the Holy Spirit's undignified. But sometimes we're more concerned. What would people say? May I, may I, I have an announcement. They're talking about you already. <laughs> there is somebody talking about you. And if they talk about me because I'm cooperating with the Holy Spirit, I am way good with that. Like, I hope they are talking about me and you because we're cooperating with the Holy Spirit so much. Y'all are a little slow to warm up today. Number eight, you'll love this one. I intend to tithe. You knew I was going to get around to your money, didn't you? <laughs> it's important. Tithe means a tenth. The first tenth of what you receive is the Lord's. It isn't yours. We bring that to the Lord. That's not even our expression of kindness and benevolence and generosity. I think that first 10% belongs to the Lord. My benevolence and my generosity comes after that. That first tenth, not mine. That's not mine to broker. That's not mine to do something with. That's God's. Why? Why? Well, the Bible says that everything is the Lord's. 
and he entrusts it to us as stewards. But we have to learn to be generous. It's not an intuitive position. Now, I'll tell you why it matters. When everything's working and the economy's roaring and the world is stable, maybe you could imagine a future where you could stabilize your own life. But folks, the world we're in isn't so stable. And the things around us are pretty shaky. And you want the help of Almighty God to secure your future. And if you haven't invited him into the resource part of your life, if you've said, this is my business and none of yours, then you don't have God's help to stabilize you. I don't give to get. I give so God understands I am trusting him with the full provision of my life. And I'm learning to say no to greed and envy and covetousness in me and learn to lead a generous life. Now, that is a learned behavior. And if you haven't learned it yet, when you begin it, it feels awkward. And you can find reasons to withdraw. You can be skeptical about Christians and what they do with it. Folks, when, uh, it's not a helpful place. I promise you, pastors didn't dream up the tithe. It's been in place about 2,000 years in the Christian church before that. But if 2,000 years of the Christian church, if pastors had dreamt it up, we would have never capped it at 10%. By now, it'd be at about the 98th percentile. <laughs> you know I'm telling you the truth. And if, if, if tithing has still escaped you, I want to invite you towards it. It will change the trajectory of your life. I have lived this one out. And I have seen it over and over and over again. Number nine. This is really the heart of the whole list. I didn't arrange them in order of significance. I intend to grow in the Lord. I intend to grow. I'm not here to maintain the status quo. What I did last year is a helpful part of the record, but I intend this year to be more fruitful with the Lord. I'm not here just to have the same set of experiences one calendar year after another. I intend to grow in the Lord. We've been doing this Bible reading while people are saying to me, now, Pastor, I've read the Bible three times. <laughs> more than one of you, Pastor, I have read it three times, cover to cover. What would you suggest now? Four times. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you're done, you'll know when you're finished, when you can start with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you can recite it until you get to the amen in Revelation 22. And I would really encourage you to go ahead and learn the maps too. But if you want to stop at the end of Revelation, you stop. When you've got it all inside of you, you just look for something else. Until then, I've been reading my Bible for a while. I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I still read it and I'll think, read something I'll think. Somebody put a new page in my Bible. <laughs> that was not there the last time I read it. I know it wasn't because I would remember. I mean, I'll meet characters I didn't know were in the story. Now, that's embarrassing. I intend to grow in the Lord. And the last line is, is really an expression of help with that. I intend to say yes to godliness and no to ungodliness. Now, this isn't complex, folks. With my discretionary time, with my, the, the, the relationships, the friends that I can have, I get to choose to be around. I'm going to choose with my time and the people closest to me, people and opportunities that give momentum to godliness. And I'm going to stay away from places and people that diminish my enthusiasm for godliness. And if I'm going to have to hang out with somebody that diminishes that enthusiasm. I'm going to take a group of people with me to encourage me while I'm with that Debbie Downer. Because I don't need much help in saying yes to ungodliness. I have plenty of momentum on the inside of Alan with that all by myself. So once I've made that commitment, I, am very, I get very intentional about that. There are places I won't go because they don't help me with godliness. There's stuff I won't watch or read. There are people I don't intend to hang out with because they will not encourage me in my, ungodly, my godliness. That doesn't mean I don't have friends that are ungodly. I do, and I'm grateful for their lives. But I am practicing. I want to say yes to godliness this year in ways I couldn't last year. And I intend to say no to ungodliness this year with a greater determination than I've ever said before. Now that set of 10 things, again, no one of those is transformational. But I want you to imagine them as tools in a toolbox. And you need every tool. There are seasons and times when one tool will be more significant to you than another. 
But you want to have a comfort level, a familiarity, a dexterity with every one of those tools. They will change the momentum of your relationship with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, we're coming up to the end of this 100 days, but it doesn't mean we're going back to our zero position from December the 31st. We want to maintain the progress that we have made. We want to hold that ground. What's next? What's that looks like? What do we do? Do we need 200 days of faith? I don't think so. I think 100 days opens your heart to the possibilities of what would happen with focus. If you took a pass on this, maybe you want to pick it up now and take the next 100. That's okay. There's no secret in January. But the purpose of going, being in training is to enable you to accomplish something that was previously not possible to you. The reason we train physically, the reason we will discipline ourselves financially, the reason we will discipline ourselves in any way is to achieve something at the end of that disciplinary period we couldn't have done at the beginning. And the same is true with spiritual things. So after you've trained, now you're prepared to try. You're ready to implement something. You couldn't do it. Well, I tried before. I couldn't. But I've trained for a season. Now maybe I can. I couldn't run a 10-minute mile 90 days ago, but I've trained for 100 days. Now I think I can. Maybe I can run a nine-minute mile. I don't know. Whatever your boundaries are. So after you've trained, you try. Now here's what will happen. You won't succeed universally. There'll be some places you go, oh, it still doesn't feel good to me. Doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you've identified the limit of your training and where you can focus in the season that's ahead. If you prayed every day for 100 days, you should have a new boldness for let's pray. You're 100 days away from where you used to say, well, I don't pray. Now you do. You've prayed every day. Now you could include somebody else in a prayer, your husband, your wife, your kids, a neighbor, somebody. Maybe now you could pray twice a day. Ooh, you are fanatics. <laughs> to your training and your effort, we, we have to add one more component, and that's sincerity. Sincerity, authenticity, they, they really go together. I've told you during the, the course of these days that sincerity alone is not adequate. Christians are offended by that oftentimes. They'll say to me, well, Pastor, I, I sincerely tried. Well, I appreciate your effort, but your sincerity doesn't make any difference. If all you're bringing to the table is sincerity. If I need surgery and you love me and you have a sharp knife, I believe you would sincerely try to help me. But if it's all the same with you, I'll pass. I'd rather find someone who has trained and practiced and brings sincerity. If they've trained and they've practiced and they sincerely don't care a thing about me, I'll take a pass on them too. The best outcomes arrive when there's been training and there has been practice and there is a sincere sincerity or authenticity. You see, authenticity is about alignment between what you say and who you are. You can come to church and not be authentic. You can come to church and be present. Roll call taken. I was there. My heart was someplace else. My mind was someplace else. My passions were someplace else, but my body was there. Authenticity means you bring alignment to that. And what we want to add to our training now is the practice of what we have trained and to begin to work to become authentic in that. Now, that is a learned process. I have come, I used to come to church, but I didn't like Christians because I was more at home with unchristians. It's because there was more ungodliness in me than there was godliness. It was more familiar to me. There should be a little yellow light that flashes. If you are truly more at home and more comfortable amongst the ungodly than you are amongst the godly. It's not a condemnation. It's an awareness of what holds the majority position in your heart. Now, we're all in process of being transformed. There's no condemnation in that. It's an awareness of where you are. Training, trying, and authenticity. When we talk about growing in our faith and authenticity and what we believe, it always helps me to remember that the Holy Spirit is the one we depend upon. He's our teacher and our guide and our helper. We can invite him in to help us see any place where there's inconsistencies. He will do that in a gentle way that brings us to a much better place. Let's pray before we go. Father, I thank you that you've called us 
And I pray that by your spirit, you will, you will help us to see anything in us that hinders us from being what you've created us for. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. Hey, this is Pastor Alan, and thanks so much for giving me just a moment of your time. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Give it a like, share it with your friends. Most importantly, subscribe. That way, when there's new content or a live stream, you'll be notified. I pray God blesses you in your spiritual journey. I'll see you soon.